Welcome to the New York Institute for the Humanities podcast. I'm Robert Boynt. In April 2006, the Institute held a two-day symposium about copyright and intellectual property titled Comedies of Fair Use. At it, the novelist Jonathan Latham made a presentation on his essay in progress, which would eventually be published as The Ecstasy of Influence in the February 2007 issue of Harper's Magazine. I'm very early in the arc of my work on copyright or intellectual property issues, and so the stuff I have to say will be correspondingly unstructured. Right now, in, in some ways, I feel I'm still in the what a lawyer would call the discovery phase, where I keep turning stones over and looking at new texts and making new comparisons and connections and Googling things. I haven't stopped Googling. That tells you where I am in the project. You know, I, I always think there's a point where you put a seal on Google and stop going there. So it's a very meta inquiry because I feel that I'm writing about or, or, or trying to learn about a realm of pastiche, collage, intertextuality that itself is intertextual with almost every other issue that I could ever possibly be interested in. It touches on aesthetics and it touches on you know, its political ramifications connect to the most basic questions of privatization of common wealth, which I think is at, as much at the center of contemporary politics as anything could be. It also has very fascinating, once you move into the realm of plagiarism and there's an area of pathology, neurological or, or psychological uh, implications that are very compelling to me. And I'll probably glance off all of this stuff today passingly. I quickly came to see that with people like Lawrence Lessig and Siva Vadinathan, I'm terrible at saying his last name yet, and Kembrew McLeod, all of whom will be part of the weekend, that from the standpoint of public advocacy, speaking in terms that could be transformative in the realms of politics or law, there are wonderful advocates out there, and I'm not comfortable in those versions of language anyway. What seems to me to be missing, or not missing, but my inheritance as I explore this stuff is to do what I do anyway, which is make innately subjective, elusive, aesthetic responses to this kind of stuff. So that's what I've been doing. But I'm going to start actually with anecdote, with the simplest possible thing, which is to say, I came to this material with an instinctive copy left attitude. I was raised in a bohemian household where my father was a painter and he used collage and appropriation methods in his art. I saw those as natural for the most obvious reason. They seemed to me to be normal in the way that the things you take for granted in your family life are normal. And the kind of art we talked about and admired, cubist, surrealist, Dada art, Rauschenberg, pop art, all seemed unselfconsciously to make use of these same methods. In fact, collage aesthetics might be said to be the only thing that every art movement or nearly every single art movement, you know, aside from maybe minimalism in the 20th century has in common. Because if you look at futurism and you look at pop and you look at Dada and you look at cubism and you look at situationism, their relationships can seem very uncertain and very fuzzy, but they all have this one act that they make their own and, and sometimes espouse as the defining act, which is the appropriation or collage element. So coming out of visual arts culture, it seemed very native to me. The second way it, it was a native interest of mine or a native leaning was my taste in music, my appetite for popular music had always gravitated towards recombinant forms. I always loved cover songs. And I was fascinated by the conjunction of a, a singer's style or a performer's style or a band style and a song that was unexpected or out of, out of sorts or at odds with what you thought of as their familiar vocabulary and what the recontextualization did to the song. And of course, if you're a pop music fan, one of the things that happens to you is you gain some understanding of pop music backwards. You think, for instance, that Al Green singing Chris Christopherson's song is an Al Green song because you don't know the Chris Christopherson song. So you think this song, which is a cowboy song, is an innately black, kind of sexy, languorous, boudoir song because that's what Al Green made it into. And then later someone shows you this other artifact and your, your mind is blown in this reverse order because you find out that Chris Christopherson wrote it and it's kind of twangy and corny and you're not sure that you would admire the lyrics the way you did when you attributed them to Al Green. Of course, everyone's familiar with the example of Elvis Presley and the way that he recontextualized huge chunks of what seemed to be black popular music all at once. There are people who 
have never forgiven him for that and never will forgive him for that. But the story, of course, if you start to investigate it, is always a little more complicated than it appears. Because if you ask most people what Elvis Presley's signature appropriation was, they probably say, well, he's saying, you ain't nothing but a hound dog by Big Mama Thornton. And it's got the word ain't in it, and it, it borders on blackface minstrelsy. But You Ain't Nothing About a Hound Dog was written for Big Mama Thornton by two New York Jews, Lieber and Stoller, who were themselves appropriation artists in the sense that they appropriated stylistic vocabularies. But then they immediately went back to the sources and supplied the voices that they admired with material that, to, to those voices, was recognizably authentic, was, was credible enough to sing. So, you know, here's Lieber and Stoller giving Big Mama Thornton a song. She sings it, Elvis Presley reclaims it, or claims it. Again, the mosaic nature of creativity and culture seems to me transparently obvious in, this, in these allegories of culture. So once sampling came along, which happened in the middle of my teenage years, I also responded very naturally to that. It made sense to me. It, se it seemed like a version of culture that I could understand and I could relate to. And as sampling became embattled, and some of the examples that were under fire, like Bismarcky's appropriation of Gilbert O'Sullivan's Alone Again Naturally, you know, was a controversial case that actually was an enormous step backwards for the art of sampling because Bismarcky lost that case and it threw fear into people that wanted to take songs like Gilbert O'Sullivan's. I don't just think that's a a legal mistake. I also think it's a great song. I love his version of that song. And so I emphasize this just because I want to say it really is a matter of responsiveness and taste that structures my predisposition in this area. I'm not operating by principle initially. I'm operating by response initially. And I think it's just worth putting forward. I'll give you one more example from the music world because it's one that really fascinates me. Is I In my early 30s, I began to hear these records that were being reissued on CD that were Jamaican covers of Motown and Philly, Memphis-based <coughs> soul songs. Basically, on the island of Jamaica, they could tune in our radio stations. They didn't have contracts and they didn't get sheet music. They listened to the songs and then recorded them by ear. As a result, the covers of classic soul songs that the Jamaican musicians were doing in this sort of proto-reggae style it's just before reggae, it's kind of in, in the mid-60s, are often borderline incompetent by musical standards because they don't have sheet music to work from. They often don't know exactly what the lyrics are. And you'll sometimes hear these very odd, and they're not typos because it was never written down, but they've just latched on to, just as a listener on the radio might latch on to a, a hook of a song but get the words wrong. These Jamaican musicians have reproduced the, the lyric incorrectly, or maybe there's some part of American soul vernacular that they didn't grasp a phrase that didn't make sense to them, and so they give it their own interpretation. I found that I adored this music, not just because it was a rough and, and sweet and beguiling version of songs that were familiar to me, although it certainly was that, but there was a way in which these recordings seemed to, to mediate between the absolute consummate slick professionalism of the Motown musicians and a fan's response to those songs. They sounded like someone singing along with the songs in the shower. But they were, of course, much better than that. But they weren't as slick and finished as the Motown versions. And there was some way in which they were a kind of cargo cult version of the music. You know, there was a responsiveness in me to the, to the sense of yearning, the sense of defiance. Of course, these were actually technically illegal recordings because no one had contracted in Jamaica to, to you know, no one had licensed the, the right to issue cover versions. But not, not in a sense that anyone cared, because no one was making very much money from them. It was, and this was before the era of the kind of patrolling in the music industry that we see now about all kinds of subsidiary rights and possible dues and royalties. But once again, before I saw the implications or the, the uh, conceptual interest, my ear was telling me there was something about this music that I liked. The second thing that led me into curiosity about these issues was being a proprietor. I started writing novels, and right at the start, my first novel, Gun With Occasional Music, this is when I was 30 years old, was optioned by a very major studio in Hollywood for a major director, a guy named Alan Pakula, who uh, made, made some really good movies and made some really commercial movies, and then, uh, if, I don't know if you know the story, died in a spectacular accident on the Long Island Expressway. 
for a few years, Alan Pakula was going to try to make a version of my first novel called Gun of Occasional Music. And since he was a, a major director and this was a major studio, what I ended up signing, not under duress because I was thrilled to sign it, but without really any negotiating room, without any options, was a contract about 50 or 60 pages high, which I had to sign in about 12 different places, which specified the rights I was surrendering down to uh, the one that always stuck in my head, theme park rights. They were going to be able to make, you know, if they wanted to make like Goofy and Mickey out of my characters and have a theme park called Gun with Occasional Music Land, they now had acquired that. You know, they were speculating on on the, the film itself, which never was made. They were speculating on possible sequels to the film. They were speculating on possible television shows from the sequels. They were speculating on theatrical presentations, musicals. All of this to do with a fairly dark, a hard-boiled story, but it did have talking animals in it. So it had a little bit of that Alice in Wonderland <laughs> potential, I guess, where they saw that maybe, maybe these characters could become something that would be on McDonald's cups. And needless to say, every possible extrapolation of this property was now going to belong to them. Well, this was fascinating to me, but I was the winner at that moment in being a, a very small fry novelist who'd gotten a very big initial movie deal. Of course, they never paid out the full price, but even the option on that was five times the amount I'd been paid by Harcourt Brace for the advance on the novel. So I wasn't someone who was likely to complain. I went on selling movie rights to various books, and when I eventually sold the rights to Motherless Brooklyn, I signed a very similar deal. And very shortly after doing so, I learned that I prevented a German theatrical troupe from doing a uh, radio performance of a chapter of the book in Germany, in the German language. Because since they were actors and they were going to d divvy up the voices, rather than just read the text aloud, it was interpreted as a theatrical presentation. And that was actually one of the rights I'd surrendered. So my agent had to tell these earnest young Germans who were bewildered that since they'd asked and he'd gone to the studio and asked that no, they couldn't do this thing. And it, it turns out that in Germany, having actors read aloud from a book is a very normal kind of promotion. And my publisher was quite disappointed and it was perplexing to them because this is what they ordinarily do with, with books is they, they, <clears throat> they get a bunch of actors around a few microphones and they, they put on a little playlist. So that was perplexing to me, but it wasn't a shock. It wasn't a surprise. I, I, I knew that this was the kind of acquisitiveness that was typical, but this was now five novels down the line, four movie deals down the line. I still hadn't seen a movie made. The posture of possession on the part of these people who'd thrown me some money but had never produced anything and yet were prohibiting other kinds of productions did rankle in a way. I started to feel a little less like a happy camper and I had more confidence and more financial security and more potential sway with my own agent and my own publishers. And I started to think that I wanted to do things slightly differently. And when I optioned quite recently The Fortress of Solitude, I had at the same time on, as I had a, a, a small partnership proposed to me with a director and no studio, I was also facing an inquiry of the kind that I'd normally had to turn down from a theatrical director who wanted to try to make a, a stage musical out of it. Normally, you have to renounce those things because ipso facto pro prohibit a, a film studio from ever coming calling. But I said to my agent, let's just, we've got a director and a director. There's no studios involved. Let's just tell them that we want to do both. What would happen if we said both? It's always only this or only that. What if I just say I'm thrilled about both proposals and I'm going to say yes to both of them? Is there any way that can work? And my agent is a good guy and very responsive to my eccentricities, but of course he's an agent and schooled by the paradigms that he works within. And he said, it'll keep financial people ever from touching either of these projects because when they learn that they don't have exclusive rights, the, the financial people will evaporate. So I got the two directors together and we talked and I said, I'd like you to take that risk so that we can do something unusual here. And I think that anyone who's responsive to this material is going to be sympathetic and we can persuade and they can see that the coexistence of these two projects is not going to necessarily be a threat or it's not going to encroach on the profitability of one, one on the other. This is, an, of course, a story in progress. I have actually have forged partnerships with both the theater director and the film director, and now we'll see whether that's going to turn out to be a pipe dream or whether there's any, uh, any potential to kind of 
innovate in, in this area of subsidiary rights. Now, I also have had another experience, and that is that when I was in a book tour in uh, North Carolina recently, a kid came up to me, like a 21, 22, 23-year-old kid, and he was in the line to, to get his book autographed, and he very furtively, but with this kind of furtive pride too, he pushed these pamphlets across the table at me, and it turned out he and his friends had been bootlegging my uncollected stories and essays, and they'd, done, they'd gotten up to issue four of the uncollected Lethem, and they had these little photocopied things, and they wanted me to know. They were at, I think, maybe they'd, they were experiencing a cognitive dissonance where they felt special and shame, you know, shameful, and they were boasting and they were, they were apologizing at once, and they wanted to know how I would respond. And of course, I had my own cognitive dissonance. I was proud of them for being such fans. I was flattered, and I was also a little disconcerted to see what was sort of a publication of my work that I had never known the existence of. But I... I said, spontaneously, I said to them, well, my rule is uh, you have to send me a copy of anything you do for my archives. I always want to see what, what's out there. So I'm confiscating these because I don't have these. And I took them from them. And he kind of looked at me and I said, go and you know, do issue five now. And I haven't heard from them again. And I don't know what their feeling about it is. But I think I've come to feel more and more that, of course, this is a natural reaction. To, it's the kind of fanish reaction I myself had as a fan. And I, I'm finally comfortable endorsing it. I like it. Another thing that happened, now don't anyone be alarmed, but my friend Dan was at the Museum of Modern Art gift shop, and he found this artifact, which is Gun with Occasional Music, the first edition of Gun with Occasional Music, cut by an artist into a gun shape. It's a very interesting kind of, you know, second use of my, my property, and it was, uh, I'll, I'll pass it around to you guys can see it. Doesn't the movie company own the rights to that? It probably they do, yeah. yeah. And this, of course, was innately delightful to me. There was something about, about seeing this because it was so unimaginable to me. Every possible dream I'd ever had about Gun With Occasional Music as the writer could never have encompassed that the book itself would be cut with incredible expertise into an artifact that wasn't sort of not my book anymore, but also depended completely upon the fact of my book. It's at this juncture where I begin to feel that my experience as a fan, my experience as a bookseller, my experience as a proprietor of rights, and my experience as a kind of long-time art world, the upbringing within the collage aesthetic that I described to you, they all kind of come together. And I begin to think about second uses, the, the second life of texts, and the unintended consequences of putting objects into the world, of making any kind of creative act. I had the luck to be guided to the work of Lewis Hyde, who was another participant in the conference this weekend, and I'm so thrilled that he's part of things. Lewis Hyde wrote a book called The Gift, and I won't assume that everyone knows it. I'll just give you a very simple recapitulation of what's, to me, the kind of epiphany out of this book, which is he describes gift economies. It's, it's sort of culture from an anthropological perspective. And he describes economies where transactions are not market-based. And a market-based economy would, of course, be, you know, I'm thirsty, you have the glass of water, I give you a dollar, you give me the glass of water, no harm, no foul. We're both happy. You got the buck and I got the water. No relationship is created, and as we all know, this is the paradigm by which the entire world is supposed to operate. Gift economies are something else. Gift economies are, I'm thirsty, and I'm glancing kind of pitiably at your water, and you pour me a glass and hand it to me. The result of the gift transaction, which is obviously much harder to quantify, is that a bond is created. I'm grateful. Now, if it's just a glass of water, you know, maybe we're on an airplane, we forget about it. It's not a big deal. But if you start to look at gift transactions as being a description of what occurs, for instance, in a family, when you raise a child, you give them immeasurable amounts of yourself. You give them value that can never be materially repaid. It's also a description, for instance, of what happens, the uh, extra value that attaches to some relationships that are financial transactions. For, for example, students pay to go to college. The teachers at the college receive a paycheck for being at the college. But if that relationship is any good, it's also got gift transaction aspects to it. There's extra transactional value. There's stuff, there's a relationship built, there's tutorship, there's mentorship, there's care, there's, there's guidance, and also rewards coming in the opposite direction that create meaning. And these other kinds of transactions, whether they're free of market associations or whether they're mingled with market associations, are what creates 
all the bonds in, in society. It's how community and family and any other meaningful human bond is, is measured is by the, the gift transactions, not the market transactions. You don't repay your parents for bringing you up. If you're a drunkard, you don't repay the guys at AA for helping you out. But in fact, what you often do is you raise a kid yourself or you help another drunkard out. And so there's this tendency for gift transactions to reverberate and become other gift transactions. And that's the structure that describes every part of daily life that can't be quantified as a clean, you know, no harm, no foul market transaction. Okay, well, so art practices are an intermingled activity. They necessarily partake of both market transactions and gift transactions. Because for them to have any real value, they're like the professor at college. The book has to be worth more than the 1995 you paid for it, for it to be any good at all. It has to be something you're going to treasure and think about and want to meet the writer and maybe want to write a book later on. It's going to have to reverberate and have these extra market capacities. The implications for the artist, then, are what do you do when your activity intermingles market necessity and, ideally, gift results? One of the simplest places to look at that description you know, of this mingled activity is in the second life of things. What the lawyers and the policy advocates have to describe and arrive at, and it's a painstaking process, is where does the first life end and the second life begin? But we can all agree that there's a value to used bookstores and libraries. Even though the authors are not receiving direct royalties for the readings of their books that result from bookstores, used bookstores and libraries, right? That's an easy thing to, to agree upon. It's also, we accept the fact that no matter how many of us go up to the Edward Munch exhibit and look at those paintings and receive the gift value in them, there's no direct transmission of payment from us to his heirs. That's a second use that we don't even hesitate over, right? We also can be delighted unexpectedly, as I was by the, the gun, by what you might call disjunctive second uses. Places where, I mean, that's not competitive with my, my, with my novel. That's not competitive with paperback editions of Gun With Occasional Music, nor is it competitive with the next novel I write. It's its own completely different thing, yet it in some way appropriated or you know, absconded nor, nor with, with other guns. Nor, nor is it competitive with other guns. Um, so there's a second use that even though it's quite immediate, follows a couple of years upon my writing this book and in some ways seems destructive or quite, you know, I was, I was certainly never asked permission about this. It was, it was a cavalier gesture. Uh, it doesn't have any feeling of encroachment. My instincts lead me to feel that that's naturally a delightful second use of, of my work. You can see the implications. This begins to touch on everything that's going to be discussed this weekend. Because when we music fans bought vinyl LPs and these pathetic cassettes, and we did this painstaking thing of dropping the needle in the record and touching the button and then making a mixtape, which was this sublimely personal act. It would take so long to make a good 90-minute mixtape. And we delivered this gift to someone. Well, no one could ever agree with the record companies who did at the time claim that home taping is killing music because only the most passionate and obsessed music fans would ever partake of this kind of second use. We were devotees that kept the music industry alive. We loved it more than the industry itself. You know, those 90-minute mixtapes that we would make, which were, you know, they were a kind of marginal act of creativity. You take great pride in figuring out which songs went where and unexpected combinations. You were kind of a DJ. But the truth is, the beauty, the power, was mostly inherent in the songs, the pop songs that you were taping. But still, no one could ever credibly argue that the, that, that kind of second use was anything short of a beautiful cultural gesture. It was a kind of participation that was nerdy and, and hopeless, but very yearning and very beautiful, and it definitely made music propagate in the culture. Now, what if it's a lot easier? What if all I have to do is cut and paste for about three minutes a file out of my music <laughs> library into an email, hit send, and I forget about it, but the recipient who doesn't know those songs is just as moved and turned on and feels just as much emotional vibration coming from me through the medium of these songs that I just cut and paste and sent to him as the recipients of my 90-minute laborious mixtapes did. Well, it's still cultural activity. It still has a relationship to the library, to the professor taking the student aside and saying, you've got to read this book. It's not on our curriculum, but this is the book you need to read. 
you know, that, that loan of that book does not result in an immediate royalty for the writer. It's definitely a related act, but it's also totally illegal right now. Okay, and it's, it's not just illegal, it's worse than illegal, it's, it's got a criminal aura attached to it. Even as its legality is debated, people are feeling like the kid who showed me the pamphlet, they're feeling confused and uncertain and weird about reaching for this cultural gesture of sending someone a song they love. I don't have the answer. For me, the resemblances are very stirring and very, very pregnant. Now, yet another anecdote, and this one is very recent and puts me at the other side of this kind of story. It's a story where I'm accused of being an infringer in a very interesting context. I was asked by Marvel Comics, uh, they've got a, a new imperative, which is they want to get literary writers to write comic books for them. They've, they've noticed that something's going on in the underground or independent world. I mean, it's no longer really that underground or independent. It's actually, as, as Art knows, it's Pantheon Books. It's a major publisher. It's the New Yorker. It's, you know, there's a lot of prestige attached to comics. And the old companies, Marvel and DC, are feeling a little left out. So they're trying to grab some of the allure, some of the luster, even often in quite incompetent ways. You know, they're watching me and Michael Shaban write about comics in, a, in an upscale way. They're watching art win a Pulitzer. They're watching other kinds of comic books end up in the uh, New York Times Magazine. And they're thinking, well, we're comic books. Why can't we have this luster? So they've asked me, along with some other writers, to write comic books. And the way they're doing that is what they think of as their standard offer, which I also think is their greatest asset, which is to say, you can write about our characters. They figure... I think mostly correctly, that the, the real enticement for moving into their framework would be if I wanted to write about Spider-Man or Thor or Daredevil. Because what else have they got to offer me? They're, sh they're showing me a work-for-hire contract. It's the worst contract I've ever signed in my life. They don't have luster yet. They're actually trying to borrow mine. And in the process, mine may be degraded because I'm going to meet them halfway. And their, luster, their lack of luster is going to probably rub off on me. So they're not offering me anything in that way. And the check just isn't that great. Even work for hire, whatever, it's just not that great a, a dollar figure. What they have to offer me is their bank of characters. You know, we are the holders. We hold these trademarks, OK? And you, yearning young fan turned into middle-aged writer, you've been dreaming your entire life about writing about Spider-Man. Well, we're going to let you. <laughs> and I did something that disconcerted them which is I said, I don't want to write about your famous characters. Those, those stories are all plumbed out. I mean, I love those characters, but if I were to do this, and I, I thought I was just speculating, and of course I was really talking myself into doing it, if I were to do this, I would want to dig up one of your lost characters, character only I loved and you know, didn't succeed, vanished from the radar. And they said, well, who do you have in mind? And I said, Omega the Unknown. And the two guys I was talking to, one of them stared at me blankly because he didn't recognize the character, even though it was in Marvel's bank of properties, and the other one sort of went, oh, yeah, I remember Omega the Unknown. <laughs> it was a character that only lasted for 10 issues in the 1970s. Well, it's very ironic with the name, the Omega the Unknown. But it was a superhero, and I loved it. Me and my best friend Carl adored Omega the Unknown, and we projected all this meaning onto it, and it was very stirring to us and very important to us. And it was a crime when it was, when it was canceled, and we couldn't believe that the story was left unfinished. Well, here I was. Marvel was saying, what do you want to do? My answer was, I want to fix and repair and finish this poor neglected, broken storyline, this character that no one cared about, I'm going to come in and take care of him now. After a moment's hesitation, they were excited because what they realized was instead of riding Superman's, I mean, Spider-Man's name, that the opposite thing was going to happen. They were going to ride my name with one of their presently unbankable copyrights. And if, I result, if the result was I made something out of it, well, then they'd have another Spider-Man. They'd have more value because they were never going to give me Omega the Unknown. He was going to remain their property. And so if I added value, good for them. And anyway, they wanted to work with me, and this was what I wanted to do. Sounds like a very happy story. But the inventor of Omega the Unknown was a comic book creator named Steve Gerber. Steve Gerber was a famously disenfranchised creator who was at the crux of the comic book work for hire versus creator control wars in the mid 70s. He invented a character named Howard the Duck. And Howard the Duck, unlike Omega the Unknown, was a big success. And Marvel, doing what they always did and what they assumed was always their right to do, licensed Howard the Duck bullshit merchandise and, they, and then it turned into a really horrible movie. But, you know, a lot of money was thrown around. 
none of the money having anything to do with Steve Gerber and the pitiable amount he'd been paid to write the comic books at a per page rate in the first place. So he <coughs> sued them and it was a famous case and it was a famous case with an extremely ambiguous outcome that a lot of different people claimed had different results. Steve Gerber, who got an out of court settlement with Marvel for an unspecified sum of money, declared himself the victor. He was David and he'd taken on Goliath on behalf of every comic book creator, Siegel and Schuster who invented Super Superman and every other. He'd gone to war and he'd come back with a fistful of money, although he wouldn't say how much, and now, Everybody knew that the people who made up the comic books were the, were the people comic books and the companies were just companies. But what happened on the other end is after settling out of court with Steve Gerber for, for a sum that was probably not as impressive to them as it was to him, they closed all the loopholes and their work for higher contracts in the, the mainstream comic books. Marvel and DC specified that every character invented while working for them belonged to them forever, period. So they finished the story the way they wanted to finish the story. And Gerber got to go off and be a famous David versus Goliath, and Goliath never made the same mistake again. Many years later, with this as, unfortunately, for, well, for people who were fans of his work and for Steve Gerber personally, this was Steve Gerber's last great contribution to the history of comics. He made up Howard the Duck, and he sued over Howard the Duck, and the rest of his career has been mostly kind of marginal and kind of about playing the role of the guy who sued Marvel. Instead of going on and creating more work, he mostly lived out a very embattled Due to, I think, temperamental inclinations or a writer's block, he's largely spent his time celebrating the fact that he's the voice of the disenfranchised creator in the history of comic books. So here comes little old me, and Marvel issues a press release saying, writer Jonathan Lethem is about to refurbish this <laughs> lost, forgotten character, Omega the Unknown. And Steve Gerber hears of it and immediately launches an extremely aggressive moral tirade against this encroachment, as he sees it, on his native moral inheritance of the proprietorship of Omega the Unknown. If anyone is ever to write this character, it should be me. I made him up. His story is mine. And here I was sort of between the, the company and the creator, and I was the infringer. Now, there are lots of weird contextualizing elements to the story. One is Gerber didn't even write all 10 issues. He was such an inconsistent producer at that time in his career that he was taken off the strip before even the 10 issues were done. And a couple of other people wrote other issues. Also, he had a collaborator. For all, all of the issues he wrote, there was another participant, a woman named Mary Screenus. And Mary Screenus contacted me quietly to say she didn't think it was such a bad idea and Steve just tends to throw a fit about stuff. Three, I went to Steve Gerber's website thinking there's something a little off about this. And Steve Gerber's own biography on his website included the phrase, Steve Gerber has put words into the mouths of over a hundred of the most famous comic book characters of all time, from Superman to Scooby-Doo. This is inconsistent. There was also an inconsistency in the very nature of Omega the Unknown. Omega the Unknown, and you tell me when you recognize the description, Omega the, the Unknown comes from a planet that was destroyed. He has a blue costume with red piping. He can fly. And Omega the Unknown, once he gets to Earth, immediately gets in contact with a teenage boy who can kind of summon Omega the Unknown when there's a problem. So Omega the Unknown was a conflation and a parody. He was Superman meets Shazam, openly. He was a parodic creation. In fact, if you look at Steve Gerber's instincts as a creator, Howard the Duck was a Donald Duck parody. Omega was a Superman parody. And another famous character of his, Nighthawk, was a Batman parody. He was a guy who tended to work in that mode. Another layer of complexity is the history of the Marvel comic universe, which is a mosaic creation. Every character, I mean, Steve Gerber's boast on his website wasn't atypical. Every writer worked on everyone else's characters. Everybody was taken off books and put on books. All the characters resulted from a kind of collective creativity. So in, I wasn't totally misguided in wandering in and saying, hey, I'll be one of those guys who writes one of those characters for a while and then it goes back to belonging to the company because this is what comic book creators in the mainstream comic book companies had tended to do. And of course, the people who wanted to do other, like Art, like Art Crumb, knew to move outside of that context where they would own their creations and get to be the sole proprietor of them, the way I'm the sole proprietor of the novels I write, until I sell those rights deliberately, as I did with the movie deals. Here were all these modulating situations, but Gerber wasn't hearing it. Gerber was conditioned by his experience. 
he comes from a disenfranchised arena of creativity. Much like blues artists whose songs all turn into Led Zeppelin songs, he is invested in the idea, the myth of copyright, because he was on the wrong end of it for so long. You know, I have the luxury of, you know, I think in some ways, prose fiction or, or just book writing in general is a kind of prince among genres for, it's very hard, first of all, to, to pillage me without being really hideously obvious and just becoming a scandal like the one we're watching in the New York Times this week. It's very hard to borrow from me in any substantive way without it really just turning out very badly for you in every, the court of moral opinion and every other way. My copyrights belong to me to begin with. No one would ever dream of asking me to write a work for hire novel, <laughs> except Marvel Comics. So I have the luxury in some ways of thinking, oh, I'll go dabble in this world of comic books because I, I can play with this mosaic creativity that, that's Marvel's tradition. Of course, the problem with it is that it is built on disenfranchisement of the creators to begin with, Siegel and Schuster and Howard Gerber, I mean, and, and Steve Gerber and all the others who made up characters and had them taken away from them, which is not to mention the complicated situations where someone appropriated a character and had them taken away from them, or someone hired someone else, you know, like Bob Kane, the ostensible author of Batman, had a guy named Bill Finger, I think that's his name, right? And who really was a hundred times better and really made up all the stuff about Batman that we remember and like, like the Joker and Robin and all the other good stuff. And Kane was kind of an incompetent craftsman. So these questions in this arena were very, very complicated. And Omega's typical. He's a parody of other comic book characters. He's collaborative at the outset with another creator who doesn't mind. He's owned by the company Marvel. And even the text I was working from didn't exclusively belong to Gerber and his, and his co-author at the time it was created. What's more, I learned, and this was, for me, finally the deciding factor, when Gerber, the, the final way that Gerber contradicted, contradicted himself that became crucial to my feeling comfortable with carrying on with the project was I found an account of Steve Gerber's invention of Omega the Unknown where he described it as an involuntary imposition. He wanted to write a comic book with no superhero in it. And Marvel said, you can't do that, you need one. And he said it was, he was dragged kicking and screaming into putting a costume character into the book in the first place. And then I thought, well, then what if value of yours am I infringing on? And of course, one of the results of this story at this point, I haven't published any, Marvel hasn't published any issues I've written of Omega the Unknown, but the forgotten character is being talked about. And Marvel has anthologized all the previous issues of Omega the Unknown, which were of no previous value to them, but with the impending release of my issues, there now has been a, created a market for these. And so Gerber is receiving a royalty on his own past work that was out of print. I don't believe that any of these things are going to quell his moral indignation against me for taking this job. Gerber's position is very absolute. And accepting that I was going to live in a world where his judgment of me was final, if I was going to proceed with this work, is something that took me a long time to arrive at in the last while. And I'm sure I'll end up discussing it with um, people who are confused, if not to say outraged, on his behalf when the book comes out. But I've decided that I, under all the, all the various conditions that have come to understand about this situation, I'm, I'm willing to, to write some Omega the Unknown comic books, because I know what Gerber can't know, which is that it's not a crass monetary calculation on my part, it's an act of passion, like, like home taping. And I'm gonna add something to the story that he could never have conceived like the gun with occasional music gun. This to me is its own innate value, even if I can't persuade Gerber personally. So I'm gonna go ahead and infringe on not a legal right, because he's actually without legal re recourse, but against a claimed moral authority uh, in this area. What do you feel about the woman who took over the wind out of using the same moral, I, infringing on that copyright I, because her I own... feel quite absolutely on the side of Alice Randall in the gone with the wind case. Why? The analogy I'll offer you is the same freedom I would feel claiming the word Kleenex or Xerox or Band-Aid as a part of American language that I now, as a writer in the American language, may freely manipulate. I think just as the Omega story involves an, a parsing of innumerable specifics, I think one of the clearest specifics in parsing the rights of subsequent artists to appropriate or alter or parody a previous work, one of the simplest specifics you could ever measure is the prominence of the precursor work. And I think just as by succeeding in getting us all to think that the only name for those objects was Band-Aids, 
By doing such a great job, Band-Aid corporations surrender to right at the same time. They won, so they lose. It becomes part of the American language. It becomes part of the common universe of reference. You can't then ask me to put a little copyright Please, sign okay. after. But let me, let me finish. Gone with the Wind is about as famous a narrative property as an American has ever produced. It's part of everyone's cultural vocabulary. Its success is beyond anyone's wishes or calculations as a novelist. It is because of the film and because of the persistence of the book and because of its relevance and because I'm sure it draws into it innumerable common points of reference. It's sourced multiply. It gathers up recognizable elements and makes them its own. It is itself no longer a protectable concept. But that was the argument that the, uh, that the Worcester group used when they appropriated Arthur Miller's The Crucible, and they lost because it was a violent. He said, but it's my play, and well, I control the rights to I it. Think, I mean, I don't know that case, and I think that that's a much more debatable case. There's a living playwright whose wishes are being expressed, as opposed to the heirs. If Roger Mitchell was alive. I have, a, I have a particular grudge against heirs. I think heirs are full of crap. And I'm sorry, I apologize to my future grandchildren, but I don't actually understand the privileges of my heirs or anyone else's to either profit exclusively, as opposed to the culture at large, or to control exclusively the gift aspects of my production. I mean, it seems to me, if you look at almost every situation where, you know, Dmitry Nabokov is excessively and overcompensatingly protective of Nabokov's copyrights. Nabokov was an appropriator. There's absolute, unmistakable evidence of his pillaging. It's almost always this case where, and this is something that I'm searching for a name for. Uh, Martin Luther King is another sterling example. Martin Luther King has been absolutely demonstrated to have, however you want to describe it, plagiarized, annexed, uh, intertextualized, Done appropriated. Done covers. Done covers. His great speeches have multiple definite sources, unacknowledged, peppered throughout them. Well, what do you have in his heirs? You have people who won't allow the speeches that changed American life to be reproduced in the newspaper without both a fee and their examination of the context. To me, this is absurd. It's a privatization of a common resource. By the time Martin Luther King's I Had a Dream speech, has been heard by everyone it's been heard by, and has changed everything it's changed. It belongs to everyone, as the word Band-Aid and as the narrative of Gone with the Wind, I think, also belong to the common. You, know, you, can, you can find degrees of separation all the way down the line. Hey. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, why, why does the Chrysler building belong to New York City? Because a building exists only in the site art of the Chrysler building belongs to us all. And if someone put up a billboard where they blocked your site to it, you could say, I have a cultural inheritance, which is I grew up in the city where everyone looks at this beautiful building. The site of it is a, is a common. It's not true. It's not true at all. I'm not, I'm not saying you would win the lawsuit. I'm, I'm talking about the, <laughs> the argument that I want to propose is that art moves out of the market realm and into the gift realm. It's a difficult process, midwifing it is an awkward thing, but it must do so. I agree with you and I totally disagree. And the reason I totally disagree is that this is great. Um, I don't know your name, but um, Jeffrey, Jeffrey just whispered to me, the guy's a communist. Um, that, that, that's what he said when, when, when you said, for the heirs, I have no sympathy. Um, I said, he's a communist. Yeah, and you know, and I am too. And if I could actually just like uh, live in whatever building I found vacant, um, this would all be okay. But as Mark Twain, who was a vocal when we were on the radio together yesterday, had it like, why have a statute of limitations? Why should it be 40 years? Why should it be 80 years? Why should it be 120 years? It's like limiting uh, childbirth so you can only have 22 children. Like, at what part does that learn? Let me contrast that with another view. And it's actually the view of one of the people who helped write or found American copyright law, and that's Thomas Jefferson. He has a beautifully crafted sentence that I'm now going to mangle in the paraphrase, but he said, there is nothing so immune to the claims of property than an idea, which can only be possessed by a sole owner while it is hidden from view. But the moment it is uttered, it forces itself into the possession of every hearer. And it's not as long as you don't say it the same way Thomas Jefferson That's right. Said. Because then it's an idea. It's like the division. Like the way we have divided this up to now is like well, in terms of expressions of ideas rather than ideas. That's right. If you think that the boundary, the quarantine between expression and idea can actually be held in an era 
of postmodernism. I applaud you. I don't oh, think sorry. it can. I'm, I'm are, you saying that, are, are you saying that there's some black family somewhere that should be getting a royalty for his quoting the Jefferson quote just now? Because of his great, 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 great grandchild? I just am not sure about the distinction between intellectual property and private property. And I actually would fall on copy left in the sense of all private property is theft. Uh, since I'm living in a situation where it's not considered that, I have to like do my best to protect my own intellectual property. Still I, don't, I don't make anything useful. In there's, a, I just have, there's a wonderful thing in Variety this very week where an animation company has announced that they have secured all the rights to Paradise Lost for an animated version of well, <laughs> animated. <laughs> <laughs> the nature, I wonder who they get the rights from. The nature of this pompous <laughs> announcement. Disney is the paradigm of taking things that were in the public oh. domain and privatizing them. And it's trying to say it sort of stops with me. What's interesting is that Disney has its mirror in the great romantic myth of authorhood, which, to steal a phrase from a reviewer in the New York Times writing about Kenneth Koch, consists essentially of apremois le deluge of copycats. I'm the last original one. All the sources that come into my work end with me, no one may take from them. And Disney produces the same. But you know, the drama Guild has broken that by when they're making a uh the musical versions of these animated features, the Dramatist Guild, by their work, the Dramatist Guild, which exists to protect the copyright of the, the, copyright of the, of the owner, has allowed now the, de the people who are adapting these books, Doug Wright and, mm -hmm. uh, if, and uh, Sh the writer of Shrek, and uh, now own their, their material. Right. And so we have brought, so well, Disney has, has acknowledged the right of the author to hold, to hang on to... Uh, yeah. yeah. What, what I would emphasize is that in every area, there are there need to be. I mean, again, Lessig says this so beautifully that corporations always win if they make it an all or nothing description. But they did, but they what what I'm saying is, case. in every case, what's needed are excruciatingly specific guidelines. Every genre, every area of possible creative practice has its own inordinately specific needs to protect the motivations for creators in a capitalist society to provide them with. A steady income, but I, I I will disagree with you quite completely, Art. That I think material private property and intellectual property has got to be distinguished as different in its innate nature. Okay, and I guess just to reiterate the point as I understand it, I totally agree that intellectual property has to flow freely, otherwise there's no more uh, no future intellectual property. On the other hand, or intellectual activity. Yeah, I mean, you can't talk. Eventually, like Marvel Comics even mm -hmm. built, uh, tried to, with DC, copyright the word superhero, yeah. after which chair is next, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and you have to pay a lot of money to be able to make a sentence. But I'm just not sure that the contradictions exist in intellectual property. I think they exist on the other side of the equation, the equation where whoever owns that Chrysler building continues to own it until they sell it, as opposed to they made their profit, it's now a public building. And at that point, I'd be very comfortable with anybody turning Mao's into a happy ending of music. Well, I think the corresponding analogy, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just groping around here, but Lessig writes beautifully about a, um, a, a lawsuit that was filed when, in the early era of the airplane, common law was recognized, recognized the rights of property owners to their right from the ground up to the heavens. That is to say, every farmer owned their plot of land, the buildings on it, the trees on it, and to the, from the treetops to the infinite sky. Then the airplane was invented. And there was a farmer who sued to stop, uh, it was actually government planes, it was the Air Force, from crossing over his property. And the immediate response of the uh, Supreme Court was, common sense revolts at the idea. They immediately went back on what law had said from the beginning of time and said, you know what, actually you own your farm and up to a certain point. And up, at, up above that is the stuff that everybody owns and flies through. So that every transcontinental flight doesn't have to sign hundreds upon hundreds of air leases to cross from California to, Here, here's the analogy I'm proposing. My book belongs to me. I wrote it. And I, I feel as adamant about that as, as art does. But I know that books are a kind of blue sky. They're a kind of oxygen. They're a kind of commons. They belong, per se, to everyone. They need to. That's their innate property, and it's the, it's the deep necessity of culture that they, that they do so. So at some point, my book, whether it's during my lifetime or during my grandchild's lifetime, or at some point, my book must just join books. 
It has to. It's not like the Chrysler building in that sense. Absolutely. By the way, that, that, did you notice that there was a very interesting thing you just said? That that's their innate property. The pun on the books have a property and our property mean two different things. It's interesting. Jonathan, thank you very sure. much for that. This podcast was brought to you by the New York Institute for the Humanities and the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. You can find us on Stitcher, iTunes, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. For more information, visit us at nyihumanities.org.